There are enough patients with complex conditions that the American Dental Academy just recognized our official pain as a specialty. It's not that the specialty is new, the recognition is new. Seeing a patient that is complex is like sitting in front of a spaghetti plate. You will take one noodle at a time, because if not, you will be overwhelmed with all of that information. And we do want the people to refer less, <laughs> not to refer more. And that's why we are teaching, because we think that the recognition of conditions that might go beyond has to be early. And as early as we recognize those conditions, the easier will be to treat them. Yeah, this is a tale. A tale, oh yeah. A tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one, bringing the best of dental knowledge. And we do it all with ease. We cover oral health and screening and preventing gum disease. We're gonna do a lot of learning and have a little bit of fun working at the dentist. A tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Endeavor Business Media's A Tale of Two Hygienists podcast. This is episode number 359. My name is Andrew Johnston, and thank you so much for being with us today. So this episode, I promise, is going to be absolutely fascinating and probably something you've never heard before. Ultimately, the question that we were trying to discover or answer was, what do we do when a patient comes in with oral facial pain? And some of the answers are very obvious. We all know the answers. You're going to take a PA. Uh, you know, doctors going to do percussion tests. We'll do, you know, cold tests. Um, so many different diagnostic things that we could do. But Dr. Padilla also shares some kind of next level thinking. And if you just put this information, the things that you're going to learn about, you put it in your back pocket, it's absolutely going to come in handy for you at some point, whether this is tomorrow or this is going to be sometime in the future. So please pay attention to this episode. You're really, really going to love it. And then next week, we're going to handle another new topic to the show. We're going to be talking about office design with architect Derek Lai. Now, there's lots of reasons to have this kind of episode, including just you know making our offices and operatories a better place for us to work in. But also, uh, I think you know the office design might be a niche career for those of you that are looking to maybe get out of the op. Maybe you don't have the calling to be a, a hygienist. Um, maybe this is something where you are dental adjacent. So if you like this episode, make sure you save it for later. Maybe you can share it with one of your friends who might be a, a good fit for office design. I think this is maybe an up and coming option for many of us that have you know been practicing hygiene for quite some time. So also Greater New York Dental Conference is happening this week. So please make sure you reach out and let me know if you'll be there. Andrew at Atel2Hygienist.com. You can also DM me. I mentioned this before, but there's going to be several people from the RDH Rant Group there, including the hosts of the RDH Rant Takeover here on A Tale of Two Hygienist. So don't forget to check out that group for the announcements about that. Um, and then one kind of just last thing before we get into the episode is, you know, a big happy birthday to us, to A Tale of Two Hygienist. We had our first episode November 22nd, 2015. And so we have been going strong for more than seven years now. And thank you so much to those of you who have been with us since the very beginning. You have absolutely weathered some very rough patches, um, but hopefully you've also enjoyed the, the smooth sailing, so to speak. And then those of you who you know listened, took a little bit of a break, and then came back this year, I've heard from so many of you, uh, it absolutely means the world to me. Thank you for coming back and listening to the show. Thank you for sharing it with your friends. And if there's really anything I can ever do for any of you, anything that you want to hear on the podcast, please, please, please let me know. Andrew at atale2hygienist.com. This podcast is meant to be for you. Uh, I want you to hear what you want to listen to. And so just give me some feedback and we'll make sure that we can get it done. So on that note, enjoy your holiday weekend. A Tale of Two Hygienists. Hey friends, quick pause in the show to remind you about the CE offered for several of our episodes. All you have to do is click into the show notes and follow the link to the CE Zoom website. Answer a few of those questions about the episode correctly and you'll be rewarded the appropriate amount of CEUs. This wouldn't be possible without a partnership with our friends at TempStars. TempStars is more than just a temp and a placement service. They are clinician led and education focused and strive to perfectly match individuals and dental offices. 
learn more about tempstars.com, or go back and listen to some of their tip episodes. They are absolutely worth the listen. And now, back to the show. Welcome, everybody, into the interview portion of the podcast. Very excited. We have Dr. Mariela Padilla on today. This might get a little bit over some of our heads, doctor. And I'm really impressed by how incredibly intelligent you are. <laughs> and But also, thank you for making time on a weekend <laughs> to be with us today. No, thank you. I'm really, really happy. I'm really happy to be here for several reasons. One, it's always nice to have this possibility of networking. But the other one, I do really love to share with others what we're doing and some tips that will help us to deal with some people, some patients that are very difficult. And I'm pretty sure that we can provide a service to everybody. So thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. But let's let's get into that though. Like you you have this passion about wanting to share information with people. Like where did that come from? Why are you, why are you the way that you are? Yeah, I always say that I'm a person with several hats. I did know that I wanted to be a dentist very early in my life, probably due to my orthodontist, but <laughs> I really <laughs> wanted to do a dentist since I once was like 12 years old. So I knew that. But yeah. also I realized that I had a passion to teach. And then when I was at dental school, I realized that I liked the challenges that are related with the patient with complex pain conditions. So I just decided to have three different hats in my life. <laughs> One, I'm a dentist. Mm -hmm. Two, I'm an orofacial pain specialist. And three, I, I did a second degree in education. And I do design academic experiences to teach about this field. So that's what I am, a combination, you know, a person with several hats. I think the, the dental hygienist can relate very well to that. I feel like we have so many hats that we are expected to either learn about or just know how to do all the time too. So thank you again for being on. We're going to talk about a population, a, a very specific patient, it sounds like today. It's going to be, you know, that patient that's been like everywhere, right? They're trying to figure out what is happening to me. I, I guess let's Maybe, doctor, if we can start from the like the very beginning, how many patients are out there? Do you feel like who have some sort of pain that they can't identify or or, or haven't been diagnosed? There are enough patients with complex conditions that the American Dental Academy just recognized our official pain as a specialty. It's not that the specialty is new; the recognition is new. We have been dealing with these type of people for many, many, many years. But now that we're recognized, I think we our, our bar went up. Now we have to teach more and to learn more and to practice more. There are enough patients out there in the world for us to need more providers, to need more people with the knowledge, not only in dental related pain, but in other conditions related with the orofacial pain vision that manifests as painful. So there are enough patients for all of us to have a big responsibility. It's not, it's not like we want to learn, it's that we need to learn. I love it. So let me ask this though, how many conditions or how many diagnoses would fall under this category? Well, good question because the complexity is huge, but I always say we need to keep this simple. So there are several classifications and the newest one was released last year from the international, it's called the International Classification of Our Official Pain, brand new. But basically we try to divide the conditions by categories. So we have obviously the odontogenic category and there is the possibility to have in dental pain that is kind of difficult to recognize, difficult to characterize and difficult to treat. So that is possible, persistent dental alveolar pain. Then you have the musculoskeletal disorders, muscle, you know, the patient that is clenching, grinding with a lot of stress, with some disorders producing localized or radiating pain. Obviously, in that same group, the temporomandibular disorders, pain in the jaw, clicking, popping, arthritis, all of that is a second category. As a third category, I will say neuropathic conditions, neuralgia, the sharp shooting pain you know, that doesn't even allow you to function. And that is a group of conditions that is, you know, very severe and patients are very desperate if they don't receive care. In a different category, we have the neurovascular. Is it possible to have migraine in the face? Yes, it is. So it is possible to have some throbbing, burning conditions that they look like migraine, but in reality, they're in the face. So again, difficult to recognize. 
Mm-hmm. Obviously, we also have those conditions that are more psychogenic related with behavior. I'm not saying that they are fake. Huh? What I'm saying is that the probably the origin of that pain is more related with behavior. So I just gave you a summary, an overview of different conditions. And I think the big, the biggest challenge for us is to recognize the source of the pain that is not always the same as the side, by the way. So different categories and we have to deal with them all. Now, so let's say that I'm just a, a general practicing dentist. Is there one of these categories that I'm likely see more than other, assuming odontogenic is the main category? Yeah, is number one is a, yeah, number one is odontogenic. You're absolutely right. And number two is musculoskeletal. So it depends on the type of population you have that might change, but the most common cause of orofacial pain after dental pain is going to be musculoskeletal. Now, our population is aging, and because our population is aging, we're seeing more other type of chronic conditions that might be related with systemic diseases. So we might, depending on who you are treating, we might be dealing or you might be dealing with more neuropathic pain conditions, for example, or with patients with dry mouth and burning sensation on the tongue, or those patients that when you do the cleaning or when you are doing some type of deep crew attach or something, you might be getting burning sensation afterwards. So I will say that it does depend on the population that you have. But in general, let's say that the second most frequent cause is muscle pain. Can we go through kind of like a diagnosis, like a differential diagnosis of if a patient goes and presents before a doctor, what kind of tests are going to be run first and foremost? And then if that doesn't satisfy the condition, then what's the next step? Yeah, nice. I think we recognize those patients that are complex at the moment that they call to make an appointment. So if you have a staff member who's well-trained, they will kind of, you know, realize that this is going to be a tough patient. Let me give you some some ideas. The way that the appointment is made, right? I, I really, really, really need to see the doctor because I'm on this severe condition. For how long have you had your pain? 10 years. Oh, so suddenly it doesn't make sense. It's an urgency now, but it wasn't yesterday. Uh, I need to see that specific provider because that is the way, the one that will help me. So looking for a hero, right? So those are red flags. Once the patient is on, on your chair, the behavior of that patient, the patient is holding, is showing a lot of painful behaviors. But when you start talking and distract the patients, those behaviors, they go away. So there is an inconsistency on the behavior. The patient who has seen multiple providers, but you know, doctor, you are the one. Again, the hero. The patient who has had multiple failed treatments, and you see that in an x-ray, multiple restorations, multiple root canals, and I still have the same pain. So that is, all of those are red flags. So once you have that, you have to prepare to do a very, very careful examination. Not that you don't do it with other patients. It's just that those are red flags with that specific group. Mm -hmm. So setting aside time, so training whoever does the intake, whether it's going to be the receptionist or office manager or someone to recognize some of these signs and, or I guess not signs and symptoms, but um, kind of characteristics. Description, yeah. yeah, Descriptions Mm -hmm. and maybe allowing a little bit more time during the exam, whether it's standard 30 minute emergency exams gets extended to 45 minutes emergency exams. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like or for more tests too, probably. Yeah. No, I think the staff has to be trained also to offer the, the potential patient. I'm going to say potential because they might not show. And that's interesting as well. That is common that, that they don't show to your appointment. But anyway, um, they will have tons of information from previous providers or from their Google search. And they will come with with files, you know, with files of information. (laughs) So you want that information to be well organized. So a key um, treating these patients that have been everywhere is to gather the proper information without distracting yourself with information that is not useful. Like sometimes they have previous diagnosis and they are sure, oh, I am sure that what I have is a trigeminal neuralgia. And I say, how you know? Oh, I Google it. Right. So I, 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 according to Google. yeah, yeah. My, my neighbor told me. Yeah. So that, that process in our official pain or in on painful conditions in patients that have been everywhere, mm-hmm. that is the key is the intake moment. The, the moment when the patient comes and sit with you at that moment, you have to organize the information, of course, but also, you know, 
you do not blame others. Be careful with that. Do not blame other providers. You have to gain the trust of the, that patient, but do not rush. Do not rush by giving your diagnosis or especially do not rush treating those patients. Do not rush. Wait, go slowly. Uh, those patients, they require more, t- more time. And could be that if they have seen 10 providers, could be that you're going to be number 11, <laughs> you know? So we have to be careful. Instead of rushing in, oh, I need x-rays. I need, you know, a special lab test. Instead of that, wait, listen, asking the right questions. And I will say that that is the key. So is some of the, um, I'm, I'm trying to think about, you know, the provider that is sifting through all of the information that they're being given. Obviously, we want to try and have as many objective pieces of evidence, you know, x-rays, things, things of that nature. Would like a hot cold test or something that's a little bit more, I guess, I don't want to say it's subjective, but like having that information, is that relevant or is that just too much information? No, absolutely. You need the facts. So you need to discriminate the information and gather the additional information that you need with the proper diagnostic tests. Mm. I tell my students that seeing a patient that is complex is like sitting in front of a spaghetti plate. You will take one noodle at a time because if not, you will be overwhelmed with all of that information. Mm. So first of all, you clarify the chief complaint. Why are you here today? What is your chief complaint today? What is the reason that you are visiting me today? And once you understand that, the next question is, where is your expectation? What is that you expect for me to do? So if the patient is looking for the hero or for the magic cure, you know that you're in trouble. But you try at that moment to set out a realistic goal. So I can help you gain in function. I can help you to identify the objective findings. I can tell you what is not. And then from there, we can set up goals. So that is very important for for me, at least, to set set up that environment of trust, but realistic. And then you start with the test. And I know that people want to know tests. Number one, rule out dental pain, always. Even if the patient said, I already went to, you know, so many providers, rule out dental pain. Do your regular testing. You know, just explore the teeth, be sure that you do some probing around, look for inflammation, infection, redness, cold and hot, percussion. All of that we have to do. Mm -hmm. Rule out cracked tooth syndrome. You know, so all of that is number one. Number two, always do some muscle evaluation because I just told you at the very beginning that muscle is the next Mm -hmm. possible cause. So train yourself if you haven't done so in how to evaluate the muscles. As the patient to clench to see if the tension or the pressure that both muscles produce on your cheeks, masseter muscles, is symmetrical. So as the patient to clench as you hold your hands and see if the clenching is symmetrical. Then push with your finger one side at a time. Push the masseter muscle to see if that reproduces the pain that the patient might have. As the patient to open and close the mouth and observe. Is the opening straight or is the chin deviated to one side or the other? Put your hands in front of the ears and ask the patient to open and close. Do you feel any clicking sound, any popping, any crepitus? You don't need to do a diagnosis. You don't need to say, oh, the patient has, you know, osteoarthritis. You don't need to do that. But you can say there is a sound that doesn't seem normal. Or there is something that is out of the normal function. Your opening is deviated. You have a clicking sound on one side. You know, that is part of our responsibility as oral health providers. And then I will say that the other thing that is important is map the area. Ask the patient to point where the pain is. When they do that, observe. Are they using one finger? Very good discrimination. Pointing a bicuspid. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Those cases I love. Good discrimination is usually easy to treat. But, it, but the other possibility is, is the patient using the whole hand, touching an area, and even worse, is the patient moving the hand around without, you know, no discrimination at all. Those are difficult questions. And finally, in this very simple testing that I'm providing to, to all of you for you to try in your own clinics or practices is, Ask the patient how the pain feels like. 
quality of pain. Sharp shooting pain, usually neuralgia or neuropathic pain. Dull, achy pain, usually musculoskeletal. Throbbing pain, usually vascular. So you have general guidelines by the description of the pain. Dental pain, though, is very particular because if the patient really, really, really has dental pain, could be everything. Sharp, shooting, throbbing, dull. So that's why doing proper dental testing is very important for us. Can I ask more about the mapping? Because the mapping is something I don't recall seeing my doctors do before, but I also don't think that we've had too many cases where I've been involved in you know, the complex patient. So I'm trying to think about the documentation for that. So a patient, if they're very aware of where the pain is, it's this bicuspid, like you mentioned, are you just writing that out in your notes or are there some sort of intraoral, extraoral photos of like, this is where the patient said, how can you be so objective with the mapping? Yeah, um, a narrative note will have to be very descriptive. So you will say pain is unilateral, located in the dermatomical distribution of trigeminal nerve. You could say something like that. That might not mean anything for some of the listeners, but if you understand the areas of innervation of the different cranial nerves, and in our case, trigeminal nerve, you can say, for example, the pain is located or is restricted to the mandibular innervation of the trigeminal nerve. Or you might say the pain extends V2 and V3, maxillary and mandibular regions. Or you might say, and that is very weird, but you might say the pain has a tendency to cross the midline. So that, that way to describe the pain will give some hints on what is the distribution, where is the origin, and a little bit about the behavior of the pain. Once in a, a while, the pain is located in the distribution of one nerve, but in a specific area. So you might ask the patient to use a finger and go around the boundaries of that pain or the distribution of that pain. And you can either describe that on your note or have a little avatar where you can actually draw what you want. Lately, we're taking pictures, you know, of those avatars and just upload those on the electronic health record. And that helps a lot. Yeah. As great as a description is, I think that, you know, it's still open to interpretation through a narrative, right? But if you have literally a extra oil photo, it's right here. You know, I think that that's a little bit more clear. I also wanted to come back. You mentioned you know, doing a muscle evaluation. All my doctors are wonderful. They're the best doctors in the whole world. However, sometimes in our education, we skip over certain parts of, you know, technical issues. So is there a way or a, a location somewhere that they can learn more about how to do a proper muscle evaluation and also maybe how to describe these things properly in notes? Nice, nice question. We live in the digital era now, huh? And Thank the you. digital era has, is changing the game. It's changing the game of teaching, is changing the game of learning, of training. And if we take advantage of that, I think we will be better providers, not only for ourselves, but also for our patients, creating resources for our patients for to be able to educate them better and also looking for right resources to educate ourselves better. And one of the things that we are doing right now at the Herman Ostro School of Dentistry is we are creating content that is evidence-based in an open source modality. Because we, are, we do believe that people has to be taught about all of this. So we have been creating resources in different media modalities. So you can look for mini clips, you can look for blogs. There, there are resources available there. So I'm, I'm just giving an example as, as we are creating some of these resources, but there are multiple resources available. My recommendation is look for them, train yourself in basic modalities to examine your patients and have a lot of a structure. So something that is funny, I always laugh when this happens. I have a smile on my face when a patient sits with me and they open the mouth. And I said, don't open the mouth yet. Not, wait a minute. There's other things that I have to do first. So I said, show me your hands. And they are like, what? I said, yes, show me your hands. And I look at the nail beds to see oxygenation of my patient. I look at the knuckles to see if there's some side, signs of arthritis. I ask them to show the palm and I see they're sweaty to see if they're nervous to see me. 
I actually move the fingers to see if they have hyperflexibility. I ask them to move the neck saying yes and saying no to check for movement of the neck. And I, I do all of that before even asking the patient to open the mouth. And that will help me, number one, to establish with the patient that I'm a different provider because I see you as a whole person. But also, I will be more careful now by asking the patient to move the head to one side or the other if they have pain on the neck. I will be more careful of asking the patient to open the mouth wide if I realize that the patient has hyperflexibility by moving the fingers. I will know that I have to go slowly if the patient is very sweating because he's very nervous. I will know if the patient has a tendency to have arthritis in the jaw because they do have arthritis on the hands. So there are some things that we should always try to do with complex patients to establish not only our new role with them in this diagnostic process, but also to gain their trust and to set that boundary, right? I'm a dentist, but I'm also, you know, a provider that will look into you as a whole. So I think that the challenge is to look for the proper training around and, and I will say the digital world is excellent, but there are multiple possibilities to get additional training. And we do offer some programs and, of course, feel free to contact us. But, but I think it's a big responsibility that we all have. Oh, for sure. And, and of course, we're going to put that link in the show notes to as much of your guys' content as we can. That way, it'll be easy for the listeners that are familiar with podcasts. Show notes are right in your podcast app. If this is your first time listening to a podcast ever then you probably just want to click on the description underneath whether you're listening on your computer or whether you're listening on your podcast app. So doctor, I, I want to go through, so, you know, the, the general doctor has tried to rule out, you know, dental pain, did the muscle evaluation, map the area, did all of the assessments that they could possibly do. At what point do they realize like, this is too complex. Like I can't handle this and I need to refer it. And where do they refer it to? Good question. We do want the people to refer less, <laughs> not to refer more. And that's why we are teaching, because we think that the recognition of conditions that might go beyond has to be early. And as early as we recognize those conditions, the easier will be to treat them. So if you treat a condition on the first, I will say probably three months, it is still not chronic. But if you wait, it doesn't matter how it started. It's chronic now. And pain itself becomes the disease. So we want the people to be able to recognize the conditions early. Uh, one of the, the goals is that the provider, the general provider, behaves as a family doctor, you know, with, with your group of patients. And, and it doesn't have to be a dentist. I'm talking about a provider like the dental hygienist, the, whoever is that first contact with the patient has to recognize that something is happening now that is different. So I did the cleaning three months ago and, and I have, you know, this sensation that is not going away. And you can say, well, it's sensibility. So I'm going to treat you with some uh, products that I will put there. But if that doesn't go away, alert, alert, something is going on. So I will say that you have to recognize early that something is weird that is coming out of the regular path. And at that moment, you take action. And the action could be try to set up a proper diagnosis. This looks more like muscle. Could be that you're clenching more, that you have more stress. Could be a systemic disease. Have you tried your blood level or sugar blood level? Are we getting some type of diabetes? Could be that the patient is aging as we all are. So it could be some arthritis. So try to recognize that early. And as soon as you know that, that what is happening with the patient is not something that you recognize easily or that you cannot treat easily, that is the moment when you ask for help. And asking for help means that the patient needs other expertises in order to be solved or to, in order to be properly served. I will say that for thanks God, we now have the official pain discipline recognized by ADA. So the providers will be announced. They will be in a list. They are already from the summer diplomates. So we have the American Board of Official Pain List. We have the American Academy of Official Pain List. So there are ways to recognize where they are. I think you all need one as we all need uh, someone to refer. So we all need this type of expert in our list of contacts 
And we offer our services, of course, but and not all of you can um, come all the way here, but look for someone in your area and call them and say, are you willing to help me? Uh, can we work together? So get your own support system and that will save a lot of headaches in the future. Literally, right, doctor? Literally and figuratively. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The thing I like, like the most about this is that, you know, so many times there's these kind of turf wars in dentistry, right? Like, you know, the general dentist should stay in their lane of just doing fillings all day. The hygienist should just scrape teeth all day. And what I like about what you're saying is that, you know, we all have a part in trying to help the patient. And, you know, it is really our responsibility. And I think, you know, the listeners are, are hearing from me that they need to be taking these education courses with the dentist also. You know, they need to be independently trying to get better at what they're doing so that they can better serve somebody who might be one in, you know, 100,000, but no, no, no. The them. numbers, the numbers are not like that. Believe me. And let me let me tell you, the real hero on the patient's story is the person who recognized earlier that something was going on. That's the hero. The one that says this is not normal. We need help. That's the person who will, will really make a difference in the patient's life. That could be you, listener. That's you. Doctor, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Do you have any last messages, any any last things that we need to absolutely discuss before we close here? Absolutely. I will say ABC with the patients that have been everywhere. A, pay attention. Pay attention to everything, the way the patient talks, the pay, way the patient walks, the way that patient has dealt with the condition before. B, believe. Believe on your patients and also believe on yourself. Trust, believe. Be sure that you have proper information and that you know that the patient is not making this up, that it is true what they are telling to you. And C, collaborate. You are not the lonely ranger. You cannot do this by yourself. You need a support system as the patient does as well. So A, B, C for all those patients that have been everywhere. Dr. Padilla, thank you so much for being on the show. I would love to have you back if you're open for it. We have a lot more things that we could probably discuss. Probably, hopefully. Thank you very much for doing this. I think this is an excellent resource. We're in the digital era and podcasts, well, they are here to stay. So thank you very much for offering this channel for the listeners. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, this is a tale. A tale, oh yeah. A tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one Bringing the best of dental knowledge And we do it all with ease We cover oral health and screening And preventing gum disease We're gonna do a lot of learning And have a little bit of fun Working at the dentist A tale of two hygienists